We're going to continue in Mark 12 this morning. I would invite you to turn there. We're going to look at verses 35 to 40 of Mark 12. And just the way the summer schedule has worked out, I know that between chapters 11 and 12, we've had a, a lot of gaps, a lot of spaces in, in time. So I want to review just a little bit for your benefit and the benefit of those who haven't been with us for those other studies. First idea is a question, how do you respond to the authorities in your life? Because as you may recall, much of what is in chapter 11 and chapter 12 of Mark is related to authority. For a while, we've been studying what's commonly called Passion Week. And that is the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry leading up to the day of his crucifixion. And then, of course, on the Sunday following, Resurrection Sunday, when he came out of the tomb. On Sunday, the previous Sunday, we call it Palm Sunday usually, Jesus entered Jerusalem, and he was riding the colt of a donkey, and he was doing so to show that he is the king. On Monday, we know that he cursed a fig tree. He condemned the temple and those who were buying and selling in it and denying the Gentiles their place to worship. All of these things are demonstration of his authority. And throughout Tuesday, various groups came to Jesus with questions, beginning with the questions, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you the authority to do these things? That was chapter 11, verse 28. And then we saw groups coming. First, the Pharisees and Herodians tried to trick Jesus with a tax question. They failed. The Sadducees asked him a theological question. You remember there was one woman who was married to seven brothers, and how is God going to sort that out if there even is a resurrection? And of course, they failed to trap him. And then we saw last time a scribe came and asked Jesus a legal question. What is the greatest commandment? And he answered well. The scribe even agreed that he answered well. In fact, he answered so well that verse 34 says, after that, no one dared question him. No more questions. Except that when we pick it up today, Jesus asked a question. Again, he's showing his authority. He is omniscient. He is God. He knows all things. He knows the hearts of those asking these questions. So let's read our passage. Hopefully you've had a chance to find it. Would you stand with me, please? I'm going to read our passage, and I'd like you to follow along as I read it. This is verse 35. Then Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say the, that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Then he said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Let's pray together, please. Our Father, we ask for your help as we study your word together this morning. I'm asking for your help, that you would strengthen me mentally and physically, and that you would give me clarity of speech. That you would anoint me with your Holy Spirit to teach your word accurately this morning. Lord, I pray for each person here and any who are joining us online that you would give us ears to hear, that you would unite our hearts to fear your name, to desire your truth in our innermost being. Lord, we ask you to do a work in us. Show us encouragement where we need it. Show us conviction where we need it. Show us where we need to change. We acknowledge that we haven't arrived. We are not perfect. We will not be in this lifetime. But in you, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In you, there is no separation. In you, there is no condemnation. And Lord, you have willed that we become more like Jesus. That's what we're asking for this morning. That you would use this section of your word to instruct us to be more like him. We ask these things 
for your sake. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. In this section, Jesus raised a question. He asked a question. And now he's asking it publicly. But in some ways, this is the same question he asked back in chapter 8 of his own disciples. Who is the Messiah? Do you remember he said, who do you say that I am? He's asking that kind of question, a very similar question of the scribes and ultimately the crowd that was assembled. That's our question to consider this morning. Is Jesus the son of David or the Lord of David or both? The answer is both. That's your spoiler. But how and why? What is the purpose of this line of questions? I've been trying to give you key words, key concepts, figure out how to state these things in the fewest words possible. So your key words for today are authority and deity. I've already been talking about authority. I think you understand what that is. If you're not familiar with the word deity, it is God. God-like, and the fact that Jesus is God. That's important to our discussion this morning. The main point I see in these two paragraphs, in three words, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. We're going to talk about what that means and why it was important to this particular conversation. But he is Lord, and one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We might as well start practicing now. Jesus is Lord. I'm going to give you a little bit of an outline. This is a really basic outline, but sometimes I give these to you to try to help you understand, map out the two paragraphs. The first one, Jesus exposed the scribes' ignorance and blindness. That's verses 35 to 37. He's exposing their teaching. They have been ignorant and blind as they have studied and attempted to teach others the word of God. Second, Jesus exposed the scribes' pride and hypocrisy. First section focused more on their teaching. Second section focused more on them, on their actions. So let's dive into that first one. Jesus exposed the scribes' ignorance and blindness. Verse 35 says, Then Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? When it says the temple, we've talked about this before, it's not the inner sanctuary, it's not that they're near the Holy of Holies. There were different courts, and they were in the court of the Gentiles at this point. So talking about the entire area, and he asks his question, starts off with how. How is it that the scribes say that Christ, the Christ, is the son of David? This is a very piercing question. It doesn't necessarily make sense to us on the surface, but what he's asking is, Do you really know who I am? Do you know who you're dealing with? Do you know who you've been trying to trip up and trap? This is the ultimate question of life. Who is Jesus? There's no greater question that we can ask, and there's no more important question to be able to answer. Now, who is a scribe? We've talked about the scribes off and on. A scribe is an expert in handling written documents. Some sort of combination of what in modern day terms would be a lawyer, a paralegal, a notary, kind of those functions. That's what he would have done. That's what this group would have done. And religiously speaking, a scribe's duties would also include teaching, interpretation, and regulation of the law. Here are the laws, here's what they mean, this is how you must keep them. We understand that they were interpreting the law, and in some ways adding to and embellishing at times. Now, how could you recognize a scribe if one were to walk in here right now? How would you know? Well, in that time and place, the scribes were very easily recognizable because of what they wore. They wore white robes that went all the way to their ankles, long white robes with fancy fringe all the way around, which is also white. And that made them stand out from the crowd because most people were wearing colors, some of them brightly colored clothing. And you could see one coming from a long way away. What Jesus said was, why is it that the scribes say? How is it that the scribes say? Well, what did they say? What he's doing is exposing their lack of understanding. 
in a very familiar passage, they had missed the point. They had missed a very key concept. And he's pointing out their ignorance. So what does he say? How is it that the scribes say, what do they say? That the Christ is the son of David. So we need to know what that word Christ means. And I know this is review for some of you, but we need to understand this. Christ is a Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. And these are translated so we can pronounce them better. But Christ is the same as Messiah. And what do both of those mean? They mean the anointed one. The anointed one. Now, I can think of two groups of people in the Old Testament, that era, who would have been anointed. Who would they be? One's on this. Okay, what? Priest and king. And this is pointing more to the political side of things, the king. If you look back, Samuel anointed the first king of Israel, who was Saul. Samuel also anointed the second king of Israel, who was David. And it's escaping me at the moment, but someone different, a different prophet anointed Solomon. Actually, a priest did, I think. Okay, so each king was being anointed, having oil poured on him, which seems a little weird to us, but that's what they did. So when we talk about the Christ, the Messiah, you need to think king. We know it means anointed one, those of us who've been in, in Bible school or you've been in, around the church for a while. It means anointed one. Well, what does that mean? It means he's the king. You've got to have that in your mind. Go back to the question. How is it that the scribes say that the Christ, the king, the anointed one, the Messiah, is, here it is, the son of David? We know, if we've read the Old Testament much at all, that the Messiah, the promised one, was going to be a descendant of David. We can find Old Testament prophecies of this in multiple books. I'm just going to rattle them off if you want the specific references. See me later. 2 Samuel, Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, and Micah all have prophecies that the coming one, the Messiah, the promised one, we would say the Christ, would be a descendant of David. I should explain that too. When we say the son of David, we don't mean his son. He had many sons. We know that he had many wives. That's a different topic for a different day. That's a problem. That's not what God intended. But he had many sons. But we're not talking about Solomon here. We're talking about a descendant, a great, 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 I don't know how many great grandson. That is this Messiah figure. The scribes knew these passages. And they were absolutely correct when they said that the Messiah would be the son of David. That is accurate. That is true. Then why did Jesus find fault with them? Why is he raising the issue? Because their teaching was incomplete. It was not incorrect, but it was incomplete. How so? The religious leaders were convinced that the Messiah, the promised one, would be no more than a man. He would be simply a man a very good king, a very good man, but he would be a man. Jesus continued asking his question. He continued, he followed up by quoting from Psalm 110, verse 1. Side note, this is more trivial, I realize, but Psalm 110 is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. There are more cross-references in your cross reference copy of the scriptures to Psalm 110 than any place else. It's quoted in Acts, Hebrews, other places. I'm in verse 36. For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, here's the quote from Psalm 110.1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. There's the quote. It says, David himself said, Jesus believed that Psalm 110 was written by David. There are people who call themselves Bible scholars today who will say that David didn't write that. Well, Jesus said that he did. That's good enough for me. Jesus wrote, Jesus said, David wrote Psalm 110. David himself said, and how did he say it? That's important too. By the Holy Spirit. I'm not trying to trick you guys. I'm just asking you to fill in the blank based on what you're looking at in that verse. David himself said in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means that he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what he wrote in Psalm 110. 2 Samuel 23, 2, the last words of David, he said, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. What's that? 
That's David describing what Peter described in 2 Peter 1.21. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Fancy word for that we use is inspiration. God breathed out. God the Holy Spirit breathed out his word through people who were writing it down. He used their individual writing styles and personalities and life experiences and vocabulary, but the Holy Spirit was the one giving God's word. And in this case, the Holy Spirit was the one giving his word through David in Psalm 110. What does it say? It says, the Lord said to my Lord. Doesn't that sound funny to us in English? The Lord said to my Lord, well, how many of you have a copy of the scriptures? You're looking in your lap or on your phone or whatever, and it has big and small caps for the first Lord. How many of you have that? Three of you. Come on. Anybody else have that? Okay. Some of you must not, and that's okay, but I'm going to explain why some of you do. Where it says, the Lord said to my Lord, in Greek, at least the, the version that I looked at, the Greek has the same word twice. The Greek word is kyrios. That's the word translated Lord. This is not on the quiz later. It's just so that you know where we're coming from. In Greek, it's the same word. The Lord said to my Lord. Now let's go to the Hebrew because it's quoted from Psalm 110. Psalms would have been written in Hebrew. That's what David would have been writing, speaking, etc. We have two different words. And the one that has big and small caps, Lord, anytime you see that, if your translation gives you that, it's referring to Yahweh. What is Yahweh? Yahweh is the covenant name of God, the promise-keeping God. He appeared to Abraham. He appeared to David. He, appeared to, he, he spoke to Noah. And he is making a promise to Moses. He is a God who makes and keeps his promises. And the covenant name of God. Those of you who are married, you probably may have had your, your full name read in the ceremony. Certainly your full name was on the marriage license. The, the promise, the covenant that God made, he used his name, Yahweh. The other name there is Adonai. So in Hebrew, if I can give our little rough translation, Yahweh said to Adonai. So the first one is Yahweh, the covenant name for God. The second one is Adonai, which means, guess what? Lord. So we have a good translation, don't we? It means Lord or Master, which also implies God. Now, here's how I'm going to paraphrase it for our own understanding. God the Father said to God the Son. That's really what we have going on here. God the Father said to God the Son. So what did he say? We probably should look at the rest of that. I've made such a big deal out of who's speaking. God the Father says to God the Son, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. What is he talking about? He's talking about the fact that David's going to have a descendant who's going to be God and he's going to be invited to sit at the right hand, the place of honor, the place of authority of God the Father. For how long? Till I overcome all your enemies, till I put everything and everyone in subjection to you. Now we know from the cross references in Hebrews and other places, who else did God ever tell that to? No one. There's no one else God has ever said that to. He said that only to his son, who is God. So God the Father said to God the Son, I am giving you a place of honor and authority at my right hand, and anyone and everything will bow down to you. That's kind of what's going on here. Now the early church, and all of us since then, who are reading and understanding the scripture, accepted the fact that Jesus didn't stay dead in the tomb, right? He rose again the third day, and what happened 40 days later? He ascended to the Father. And where is he now? According to multiple passages in the New Testament, where is he? He is at the right hand of the Father. So we recognize that this is a fulfillment in Jesus Christ who rose again and ascended to the Father. That's who we're talking about. We understand doctrinally what's going on here. We have a great advantage over the scribes who are trying to interpret it just based on their understanding of the Old Testament. I, I grant that. Here's the problem. 
the scribes were happy to have a political messiah, a political king, just a man, who would free them from tyranny. But they didn't expect, and I dare say they didn't even want, a messiah who would be God. Because what was their main concern? Everybody was looking for the messiah to come and free them from the bondage of Rome. That's what they thought would happen. So they were looking for a general. They were looking for a king. They were looking for a political figure. Now, can you think of any ways that we've adopted this line of thinking today? Many people believe that Jesus was a good man. Or maybe they'll say he's a good teacher. But they don't believe that he was a miracle worker, let alone that he was God himself. What about us as believers? Are we viewing Jesus as some sort of divine genie who will simply help us and bless us and keep us out of trouble but without requiring anything of us? Jesus said, if a man will come after me, is this what he said? If anyone wants to come after me, let him ask for prosperity and wealth and blessing and he will receive it. Why are you laughing? That's not what he said. What did he say? Mark 8, 34. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's what Jesus said. Here's the problem that I run into at times, and I think you do too. We want to call our own shots. We want life to go the way we want life to go. We want everyone to do it our way. We want a perfect, happy, easy life. And all the while, we want to say, yes, Jesus is my Lord. He's my master. But there's a problem there. Here's how Luke recorded it. Jesus asked, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? There are many people, and I think there were in those days also, who want to be followers of Christ. They want to be his disciple until it costs something. Until there's some sort of persecution that arises against me. Until I have to give up my own will or my own comfort or my own money. And until it costs, I'm in. I'm good. I'm following. And then when there's a cost, I don't think so. I think I'm going back to what I was doing before. What's the main idea for today? Jesus is Lord. Don't call him Lord if he isn't your Lord. Verse 37. Therefore David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? Another way to say that is, in what sense can he be his son? And again, this is lost on us because we don't think of it this way. In that culture, you would never tell, call your son, you would never call one of your descendants Lord, Master. That's absurd. I'm going to take you back to the book of Genesis for a second. You don't have to turn there. But Genesis 37, we have the story of Jacob and Joseph. Joseph was the favorite son. And you may remember that he had some dreams. In the first dream, we know what it means. It means that his brother's we're bowing down to him. In the second dream, it was 11 stars, sun, and moon. And they all bowed down. So he, he shared the first dream, and his brothers were irritated with that. But his, his father said, oh, okay, that's, okay, that's good. We don't know what will happen. But then he shares the second dream. I'm going to read three verses for you. This is from Genesis 37. Then Joseph dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, moon, and eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him. His father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down before you? Here in the Hebrew it says, No way, Jose. Not really. But... He's saying, absolutely not. There's no way this is happening. That's fine. You can, you can have dreams that your brothers bow down to you because I like you the best anyway, but I am not 
bowing down to you. Why did he say that? Because he doesn't love his son? No. Because he would never think of calling his son Lord. That's their context. That's their culture. That's why this was so shocking. Now, as I read this to you, as you're reading it again yourself, is there an answer to Jesus' question? Did he answer his question for them? Not, not really. Jesus didn't answer that question for the religious leaders or for the crowd and not even later privately for his own disciples. But we can answer it easily because we understand one important fact, and that is that Jesus is the Son of God. Isn't that how Mark began his gospel? Again, you don't have to turn, but Mark 1.1 1, 1 says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's been his point all along, that Jesus is the Son of God. The only way any son could be greater than his father would be if he were more than just the son of his father. So I'm going to put it this way. The Messiah was more than a political leader. He was more than a religious leader. He was more than a mere man because he was God himself come in human flesh. So he asks this question of the scribes and he points out a problem in their doctrine. You say you're experts in the law. You've read this many times. You recognize that Psalm 110 is a song about, a psalm about the Messiah. It's a messianic psalm. It's a prophecy about the Messiah. And yet right there it says, David said, the Lord said to my Lord, why would he call his descendant, the Messiah, Lord? They didn't have an answer. And we understand the answer is because he is God. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, is God. Now, I don't think the people got it necessarily, but they liked it. You see that at the end of verse 37? And the common people heard him gladly. The great multitude heard him gladly. Not necessarily understandingly, but what they liked is that he was speaking with authority. We can go back earlier chapters of the book of Mark. He didn't speak as one of the scribes. He taught with authority. You remember that? Same thing here. He's correcting their error. He's correcting their wrong teaching. So first he ex exposed their ignorance, their blindness. It's right there in the text. But they didn't see it. And I don't think they wanted to see it. Second, Jesus exposed the scribes' pride and hypocrisy. These three verses, verses 38 to 40, give us the ending account of Jesus' public ministry. We read in the Gospels, there are times he preached to the multitudes. There are times he healed multitudes. There was a lot he did out in the open in public. But as we've seen the progression of this Gospel, it's gotten less and less public. And what we see here is the last public statement that he made. What he's doing, this is kind of like the final blow in his conversations with these religious leaders. And Mark's version of it is shorter. If you want to read in much more detail, you can look on your own at Matthew 22 and 23. Look at that this afternoon. In Matthew 23, you'll read over and over again, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because of this, that, and the other thing. There are six or seven different things he says in Matthew 23. Here we have a much shorter account that Mark gives us, but this represents what many people consider the final break with these religious authorities. Verse 38, then he said to them in his teaching, Jesus is continuing. He's asked the question. He hasn't really answered it publicly, but now he's continuing his teaching publicly. Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. He starts out, beware, which means watch out, look out. It's a warning. It means to guard against. To guard against what? To guard against the evil actions and motives of the scribes. He's used this word before, back in chapter 8. Jesus used this, this verb to warn against this false teaching. But now he's warning against the false teachers. He's being more specific. He's saying, don't act like these people. Don't be motivated the way they are motivated. And it, it, it's not universal. It's not saying every scribe acted this way because there seems to be some teachable spirit in the scribe in the previous section. 
the one who came to Jesus to ask about the greatest commandment and then his response. So it's probably not universal, but many of these scribes would have acted this way. What did they do? I've already talked about their long robes. They went, went around clothed to look special, to look different and to draw attention to themselves. What were they doing that for? Because they loved to be greeted in the marketplace. Hello, rabbi. Hello, master. Hello, teacher. One of my commentaries said it was customary if you saw a rabbi, or, or a, sorry, a scribe walking around to, to kiss his hand in the marketplace to show this kind of Respect is good, but almost worship, that'd be bad, right? Greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues. So to put it in our modern context, I know it's not a, a perfect illustration, but in our church building, in our service, where are the best seats? Where do people try to sit first? Front or the back? Most people. The, the truth is, I thought about this question. I thought some people are going to say the front, some are going to say the back. In my favorite spot is the answer, is it not? Okay. But for some people, that's the back. Some people, that's the front. Here's what it was like for them. They had a chest, normally, a box. And the person who's reading the scripture would, I believe, read standing behind that. And the box itself is where they kept the scrolls that they had for that synagogue. But they had seats right in front of the box. So here are the scribes sitting there, pious, tall, making sure everyone could see them, see their faces, see their long robes, see that I am here, maybe I'm nodding once in a while to make sure everyone knows how spiritual I am and how much I know about the word of God. That's what they were doing. It says they loved the best places at feasts. These were probably seats or couches uh, the place of honor, the head table, and what's more, they were probably seated either to the left or the right of the host. The best place, that's what they wanted. In fact, don't invite me if I'm not invited to sit at the best place. And then it shifts a little bit. What does it mean to devour widows' houses? It's not like they're eating houses, that's silly. What is it saying? Well, one of their functions, I said early on, they, they were in charge of legal papers, documents. And these individuals did not receive any pay for what they did. But one of their responsibilities was to help with wills and estate planning. And particularly for widows who don't have anyone to leave their possessions to. So that gave them the opportunity to steal away the property, either to say, you know what, our tithes and offerings have been down, so we need you to leave all of your estate to the temple or to our synagogue or whatever. Or, I really have been struggling financially, and I think if you would just leave everything to me, I, I would obviously tithe off that, and I, I would do a good job making sure the money was distributed well and fairly. Maybe I could even help some other widows with it. They, they often would manipulate. They weren't looking out for the widows in their best interest. Read your Bible, folks. Does God care about widows? Does he care about orphans? Does he care about strangers? Yes, he does. Do you think he took seriously that they were extorting widows? Absolutely. And Jesus was calling them on it. If it could get worse, I think it does here because the last statement is for a pretense they make long prayers. So just to finish the story, let's say that this widow has come and I have extorted her and let me just say a prayer of blessing over you. And we also know from other passages that they would go out in the marketplace, let me stand on the busiest corner I can and let me just say a long, long, loud prayer, many words. Why? To be seen of men. And what did Jesus say in Matthew? They have their reward. They have their reward. They don't have any other reward coming for that prayer. That's the kind that truly is going to bounce around the ceiling. Now, what does this sound like to you? What does this sound like? You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to have a huge vocabulary to understand reading this. There's a problem here. Two, probably. There's a problem of pride. A big problem of pride. And what does the Bible teach us about pride? God resists the proud 
and gives grace to the humble. And the other problem I would see is that they're hypocritical. Let me pray this lofty, long prayer even though I'm stealing from you. Earlier in this gospel, Jesus said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is from me. God hates hypocrisy, wearing a mask, faking it. These scribes were religious hypocrites with no love for God. One of my study Bibles said, true followers of Christ are not distinguished by showy spirituality. Reading the Bible, praying in public, following church rituals can be phony if the motive for doing them is to be seen by others. I'm glad you're here this morning. Praise God, you're, you're gathering with believers. Thank you. Please don't do it for other people. Those of you who give, praise God. Please don't do it so other people will see. Don't, don't read your Bible or pray just so that you can say, well, when I was reading in my Hebrew Bible yesterday, do it out of love for God. Isn't that what we saw last week or last time? What's our first obligation? Love God. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the right motive. Don't do these things out of hypocrisy. Better not to do them at all. Here's some questions as we close. What place does God's word have in our lives? Do we know it? Do we read it? Do we study it carefully? Odds are these scribes had Psalm 110 memorized and they had missed the forest for the trees. Maybe in this case, they missed the trees for the forest. But they had missed the truth in spite of knowing it, studying it, probably memorizing it. But it's not even enough for us to study it carefully. We've got to live it. We've got to act on it. We have got to allow it to change us. Why do we serve God? We should do it out of love. But we need to ask ourselves, am I doing this for status? Am I doing this for recognition, for titles, for some sort of gain, monetary or otherwise? Are we doing it only to impress other people? And then what I said was the most important question. I don't think we can ask a more important one. Who is Jesus? Who is he to you? Lord of lords, amen. If anyone here, anyone out there, believes he's just a man, he's a good man, Your eternal life is at stake. We have to believe in the one and only God who sent his son so that we don't have to perish but have eternal life. We believe in him. We believe in Jesus Christ, the son of God. At the beginning I asked, how do you respond to the authorities in your life? I'm most concerned about that authority. How do you respond to God come in human flesh? Because Jesus is Lord. It's one thing to say, Jesus is God. I trust you believe that as well. He is. But Lord has a slightly different implication, that he is my master. He is the one calling the shots in my life. I am living as his servant. You could even use the word slave to please him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Is there anyone who would say, Bob, the Lord addressed something specific in my life today? And by his grace, I'm going to obey. I'm going to act on it. That might mean stopping something. That might be starting something or restarting something. I don't claim to know. But if that describes you, that there's something specific in your life 
that by God's grace is going to change as a result of something he has shown you from his word today, and you'd like me to pray for you, would you let me know that by lifting your hand and putting it back down? Is there anyone? Yes? Yes? And last, is there anyone who would say, he's not my Lord, in fact, he's not my Savior. I'm not so sure about all this. Or I don't know whether I've put my faith in him. If you're concerned for your soul this morning, same thing, would you simply put your hand up, put it back down, I'll be glad to pray for you. I'm not gonna call you down. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is alive and powerful and that it does its work in our hearts. And that's what we're asking for, that you would continue to do a work in us to bring us into conformity of the image of Christ, that we may bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.